My name is Chris Holgraf. I work at UC Berkeley with the Jupiter team there, as well as with a new nonprofit organization called 2i2c. And today I want to talk a little bit about the new technology stack underneath the new Jupyter book rewrite. Uh, so if you're curious and you want to follow up, uh, go to this bit.ly link and you'll find these slides. I've inserted a lot of links in slides throughout the talk, so you can also use this as a reference. And before I go any further, I want to thank the other leaders and contributors in the Jupiter, uh, in the Executable Book Project. This is the parent project that's uh, serving as the main steward of Jupiter Book, as well as the collection of other tools I'm going to talk about today. So really, this team is the group that's, that's done all of the work here. Okay, so really quickly, what is Jupyter Book? If you haven't heard of it before, the goal of Jupyter Book is to allow you to take a collection of Jupyter notebooks and markdown files and convert them into a more book-like form, whether that's as an HTML website or as a PDF. Um, I'm not going to talk much about Jupyter Book today in this talk, um, but if you're curious to use Jupyter Book yourself, if you want more of a user-facing perspective about Jupyter Book, I recommend that you go to jupyterbook.org um, and check out the documentation there. Okay, so a little bit about the rewrite for Jupyter Book. The goal of Jupyter Book, uh, the, the goal of the rewrite of Jupyter Book was to basically take a fairly complex and isolated stack and make it more modular, more extensible, um, make it support more uh, publishing focused features, as well as to make it a little bit easier to both install and use. Um, and throughout the whole rewrite process, one of, our, one of our hopes was that we would be able to, by making it more modular, integrate it with a previous uh, open source ecosystem of tools that were already out there in the Python ecosystem. So the previous version of Jupyter Book used uh, two tools primarily. One of them was nbconvert to convert Jupyter Notebooks into HTML files, and the other was Jekyll and the language Ruby to, con uh, to stitch together those HTML files into a static website. The new Jupyter book has standardized most of its stack on Sphinx and the Sphinx documentation ecosystem um, that has been a mainstay in the Python community for many, many years. Um, and we hope that that will bring a whole lot of improvements and quality of life uh, improvements as well along with it. So the new Jupyter book stack is more modular in the sense that each individual piece of Jupyter book can now be used on its own or as a part of the Sphinx ecosystem, as well as integrated into Jupyter book. It's also more extensible because you can now take any Sphinx extension and bring it into one of your books, if you wish, via Jupyter book. It's more streamlined because it's entirely built on top of Python now. You no longer have to figure out how to install Jekyll. And it's also more powerful because Sphinx itself is a very powerful documentation engine. And Jupyter book now piggybacks on top of all of those publishing rich features in the Sphinx ecosystem. So let's have a really quick overview of the stack to figure out what happens when you build a Jupyter book with this new stack. So this is going to be a busy slide and I'm going to step through it um, one by one. Uh, when you author your content in Jupyter book, not much has changed. We expect you to be able to write your content in both Jupyter Notebook files and in Markdown files here. And Jupyter Book can use another tool in the open source ecosystem called Jupytext to convert back and forth between them. When you build your book, if you need to execute any computational content that's inside of your book, then a tool called Jupyter Cache will handle that process. What Jupyter Cache does is it takes a collection of Jupyter Notebook files it executes them, and then it caches their results so that the next time you try to execute that file, it will only do so if the code cells have changed. So if, if you've already executed and cached a notebook, and then you try to re-execute it again, then you'll be able to just take from that cache and then insert them directly into a document rather than unnecessarily re-executing a second time. Once you have those cached outputs in a notebook, um, then we use uh, parsers in the Sphinx ecosystem to bring either those markdown files or those notebooks into Sphinx, into Sphinx's own internal document representation. And then we insert the outputs from executing the notebooks into this document representation so that it can make its way into the final book. Finally, once we have those documents, we can combine them with a collection of uh, extensions in the Sphinx ecosystem that basically just extends functionality in one way or the other, and then create final output artifacts, either via HTML or via PDF and LaTeX, and customize those artifacts to look the way that we want to, and in this case, to, to look like books uh, when, when we finally output our end product. And then Jupyter Book now is basically a lightweight controller process that manages all of this complexity and that pieces together these modular tools. 
So let's talk about a couple of the main pieces of that process that I just explained. So first off, you need to parse your Markdown or your Jupyter Notebooks into Sphinx. So how does that work? The first thing that I should note is that Jupyter Books Rewrite now introduces a new flavor of Markdown called MIST, or Markedly Structured Text. The goal of MIST is to bring the best features of restructured text in the publishing Sphinx ecosystem into a flavor of Markdown, so that you don't need to learn a new markup language in order to have the rich publishing features of something like Sphinx and DocUtils. MIST is a superset of common mark Markdown, which means that almost any pre-existing Jupyter Notebook is also a valid document that can be parsed with uh, Sphinx, but it also has an extended syntax for more publishing-rich features that I'll talk about in a little bit. Here are a couple of examples of extra syntactic pieces in MIST Markdown that don't exist in Common Mark, and that's things like front matter, comments, um, special math formatting, and tables. And I'll also note um, a special kind of syntax called a directive, which is particular to the Sphinx ecosystem and particularly powerful, and I'll go into it in a little bit. The way that we parse that markdown in, uh, in Python is with a new package that we've created called markdown it pi. This is a Python implementation of a very popular package in JavaScript called markdown it, and it provides both a configurable and a pluggable syntax to parse markdown into a collection of tokens. Um, and we have both a Python API and a command line interface for that. So it's like any other markdown parser. You can pass it a string of markdown, and it's going to output a set of tokens. And on the right here, I'm showing how you can then trigger the behavior of markdown it to, to learn and understand new kinds of syntax. So it's fairly easy to extend beyond the base common mark representation that markdown it pi ships with. So to, piss, to parse mist markdown, we use markdown at pi with a collection of extensions that are designed for mist markdown. Um, so mist markdown is a common mark and mist markdown parser for the Sphinx ecosystem. It's just an extension like anything else, and you can install it with that configuration uh, that I'm showing at the bottom of the page. Again, it doesn't only work with Jupyter Book. You can use it for any Sphinx website that you would like to. Um, and one of the most powerful things about mist markdown is that it brings the 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 two pieces of Sphinx that are most extensible and powerful roles and directives into the markdown markup language. So really quickly, what are roles and directives? I think about them kind of like the markdown or the markup language equivalent of functions in Python. So they have uh, directive names or role names. They have arguments. They can have configuration. And effectively, they, effectively, they're just ways for you to define arbitrary mappings from arguments and configuration values into whatever the final output is that you might want. So as an example, say I want to insert a figure into my document. I can use the figure directive, which we're showing here on the left in Mist Markdown. Um, I pass it an argument, which is a path to a PNG file, and then I can use the key val um, arguments to add new pieces to that figure, like a caption or a label that I can refer to somewhere else. And the same pattern is roughly true for, for roles as well. So once we've parsed our uh, our markup language into Sphinx, how can we do the same thing with notebooks and also take advantage of the execution infrastructure that we need um, for interactive computing? So for dealing with notebooks in the Jupyter Book ecosystem, we now use a Sphinx extension called MistNB. And this is primarily a Jupyter Notebook parser that knows how to speak Mist Markdown in the Sphinx, the Sphinx ecosystem. It also provides a controller process that manages that caching and execution that I spoke about before. So it uses Jupyter Cache to execute cache those notebooks and then insert their outputs into the document. It allows you to um, write MIST markdown, including roles and directives inside of those Jupyter notebooks. And that allows you to do some interesting things like actually store a variable in a Jupyter notebook and then insert it into another page in your book. Um, and then finally, one thing that MIST NB allows you to do is write your entire notebook only in Markdown. So if you want to have a more text-friendly, a more collaboration or Git-friendly version of a notebook, um, MIST NB also supports something called MIST Markdown Notebooks, which allow you to have the full structure of a notebook, but only in MIST Markdown. So here's an example of a notebook in JupyterLab on the left and how that notebook is rendered on the right. As you can see, not a whole lot changes from one to the other, except that the code has now been executed and the results are now inserted directly into your Jupyter Book page um, instead of, uh, of 
uh, and I should say, you can also cache those outputs so that that execution would not have happened if the notebook had already been run. On the left, I'm showing how you can insert cell metadata into notebooks in Jupyter Lab, and that's also important because this is a pattern that's commonly used to control different kinds of behavior in Jupyter Book using um, cell level metadata in Jupyter Lab, like hiding inputs, hiding outputs, that kind of thing. Um, and as I said before, if you want to write your entire notebook in Markdown, then MIST NB knows how to use a tool called Jupitext to convert back and forth between MIST Markdown notebooks and IPy NB files. So as I mentioned before, um, Jupyter Cache is the tool that we use for um, both executing and then caching the outputs of a notebook to make sure that you're not unnecessarily rerunning computations the next time that you build your book. Um, it provides both an, a Python API as well as a command line interface for managing this process, and it can be used on its own separately from Jupyter Book, um, as well as being utilized as a part of the Jupyter Book build process. Um, here's a really quick diagram of the kinds of uh, steps that it takes every time you execute and cache something. But the basic idea is that it stores the outputs of your notebook in a local database, and then it hashes the identity of each notebook so that you can compare its current state with the last state of the notebook when it was last executed. And that way, you can know whether you need to execute a notebook a second time or if you can just pull from the cache that's already there. And then finally, I want to note just a couple of really quick extra Sphinx extinctions that are only possible because we're building on the Sphinx ecosystem. And a lot of what Jupyter Book does is it develops a new Sphinx extension that anybody can use in Sphinx and then finds ways to integrate that extension into the Jupyter Book ecosystem. So uh, the Sphinx Book theme is a book-like Sphinx theme that provides that kind of left sidebar table of contents, right sidebar within page navigation, and a lot of other book design features. Um, it's loosely based off of Edward Tufte's uh, philosophy towards visual design for, for um, book-like content. Um, here's an example of a Sphinx book theme layout. I'm showing you the um, buttons on the top that provide some quick interactivity. It also provides certain layout elements for um, showing and hiding different uh, code blocks, inputs, outputs, things like that, as well as book-like features such as a sidebar and a margin that I'm showing here on the right. Um, we also have a, a tool for providing really quick access to Thebe, a tool for uh, rapid interactive coding that is um, inserted into static web pages. So you can insert Thebe buttons into anywhere in your Sphinx documentation. Sphinx Panels provides a set of roles and directives to really quickly add in um, more composable user interface elements onto your Sphinx documentation, such as collapsible panels, buttons, um, tabs, documents, things like that. And Sphinx Comments is another Sphinx extension that allows you to insert um, comment-based web tools into your website. So things like Hypothesis, which I'm showing on the left, um, or Utterances, which uses uh, GitHub issues for comments, which I'm showing on the right. And as I mentioned before, what JupyterBook now does is effectively ties together all of these individual tools and then provides it um, via a command line interface that just really quickly gives you a configured and customized Sphinx deployment that you can use to build your, your book content on its own. But each of these pieces can also be used completely separately as a part of Sphinx websites as well. OK, so that's it for this new rewrite. Those are the sort of major building blocks that make up the new version of Jupyter Book. Um, if you're interested in learning any more about them, I put links to each one of those packages on the slide where I talked about it. As well, here are a couple of links for the Jupyter project more generally. Um, if you have any questions or if you'd like to make any contributions yourself, as I mentioned before, Jupyter Book is an open source project and we welcome contributions from anybody. You can check out some of the links here for more information um, about how to get involved and how to use these tools. So thanks very much.